Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you for watching. So for those of you who have been watching the channel for a while now, you will know that I purchased a Supermax air filtration system recently. And one of the features of the unit is it has a remote. Now, the problem with the remote is there is no way to attach this remote to anything. There is no string, there is no hook. It's just a free floating remote. So I thought that I would design a holder that I can stick on the wall or on the workbench and have this remote close by for whenever I need it. So I thought I would bring you along my journey from concept to design to reality for a holder for the remote unit. So if you like this type of content, I encourage you to go ahead and subscribe, ring that bell, very important these days, uh, so that you can follow on with future videos that I make that are similar to this type. Well, let's start with getting some basic measurements of the remote. So I have my calipers here, and I'm gonna do everything in millimeters because that is just easier for the 3D printer. Uh, normally, I would do things in those evil imperial dimensions because I am, you know, in the United States, but so we have the size it is uh, 56 millimeters wide it is 17.7 millimeters thick and 81.5 millimeters tall so now the concept i have is just simply a rectangle that the thing sits in and it's got a little bevel on it or chamfer on the front to make it easier to get the remote in and out so what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to fusion 360 and we're going to start designing our part all right so here we are in fusion uh, let's first start by creating a sketch on the bottom plane. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with a construction line that sets the base dimensions of the remote in the model. So we will hit X for construction, and then we will hit R for rectangle. And it was 17.7 millimeters tall and 56 millimeters wide. The reason we're using construction line is, is we don't want this rectangle to be part of the extrusion when we make it later. Let's go ahead and slide these dimensions out of the way right now. And what we are gonna do is we are gonna offset from that construction line about one and a half millimeters. That'll give us a little bit of play. So let's hit X to turn construction line off. You can also click the construction icon right here. We will hit O for offset, select the line, and then type 1.5 millimeters. And that gives us our first point of offset. Next, we wanna create the perimeter of the actual rectangle. In this case, I settled on a width of about 3.2 millimeters in my mind. Why did I set 3.2 millimeters? Well, 3.2 is an even multiple of the nozzle diameter, which is 0.4 millimeters. So let's go ahead and say we want to hit O for offset again. We're going to offset our construction line. And we're going to do 1.5, which is the inside dimension of the rectangle, and then add 3.2 millimeters right there. Okay, so with that, we will finish this sketch, and we will start by extruding up the distance that we want. Now the remote is 81.5 millimeters tall and you don't want the rectangle to go all the way to the top or you really won't be able to get the remote out even if we put the, the bevel on the front. So let's go ahead and bring it up 60 millimeters and see how that looks. So we will hit E for extrude. We will select our rectangle that we made and we will type in 60 millimeters and it will extrude straight up. All right, so there you go. You have your basic uh, rectangle. Next thing we wanna do is put a design on our sketch or on our model, I should say. So I'm gonna turn the sketch back on. I wanna hit E for extrude again. I will select this profile and the base profile. And in this case, we will extrude down 3.2 millimeters to give the base oops, down, negative, to give the base the same thickness as the wall thickness. Now it doesn't have to be, but in this case, uh, it seems pretty reasonable to do that. So, and it'll automatically select join over here. So you click okay. If we turn our sketch off, you'll see we have a fully formed model with a base. That looks awesome. All right, next thing we wanna create that bevel on the front. So we are gonna create a sketch on this face, which in this case happens to be the right face. 
We'll start by creating a line by hitting L, start at this corner, take it out a uh, distance. In this case, uh, I'm not going to dimension it right now. I'm going to dimension it in the next step. So we'll take it out a little bit, click the mouse, click it again, and bring a line down so it's coplanar with the front face. We'll hit escape to get us out of the line tool. I will hit D for dimension. I will select this little line and we will say that it's 3.2 millimeters, which is the same thickness uh, as our wall. And then D for dimension again, select this point and that point, draw this line out and I want to make the bevel 10 millimeters. So there you go. Now you have a fully dimensioned set of lines on that sketch. So next we want to cut the top off and the way we do that is by hitting E extrude. We select our sketch there and then instead of going to a particular distance we will say to object and we will spin this around and select this face and it will extrude through the part to that face. And what that actually does is it does a cut on the model rather than a join, so it'll actually cut the face off there. So we click OK, and there you go. You have your bevel. That is amazing. OK. Couple nice to have for these models is to provide a nice rounded edge. So we will fill it the outside edges. It gives a nice softer feel to the finished product. So let's go ahead and say fill it. We will fill it all four of the outside corners by selecting them one by one. And then say, let's fill it two millimeters. That looks pretty good. Could probably go a little bit more even, but uh, two should be fine. I'll click OK. Next, I want to fill it the inside corners here as well as the outside top. So I will hit F for fill it again, select that chain and this chain. I will fill it this say one millimeter should be fine. One looks pretty good. We could probably go even more, maybe up to two, but one should be fine. I select OK, hit F for fill it again, select, oops, not that one, select that one. And that one. Now you can do all these fillets in one operation. You can see here in the new fillet window, they made this modification about a year or so ago, where you can have multiple fillets in a window. Um, I am not doing that in this case just because I'm trying to be a little bit more instructive in this video. Okay, so this fillet, uh, let's see, if we do one millimeter. So one is a little big. So let's do 0.5. That looks okay. It's a little small. <laughs> so in between might not work, but we'll do 0.5. Okay. So that gives us a nice rounded profile. That should be nice and smooth in the hand and not, uh, you know, not too rough. So next thing is we need some way to attach this to the wall. My original thought on the back was to create some sort of holder or some insets where you can slide some screws in and uh, it just to me seems that that's going to be more complicated than it needs to be. So what I thought I would do is I would just create some holes through the front right here on this face and then we can just screw right through and attach it to the wall. So that's what we will do. So we will click sketch. We will click this face and it will create a sketch on that face. Create a circle. Now I'm going to use regular old drywall screws to attach this. So I have one here and I'm going to use the calipers to measure the thickness to see how big the hole should be. So we have uh, 3.98 or so, so four millimeters in thickness for the drywall screw. So that should be fine. So we want a hole that is just slightly larger than that to give us a little bit of extra play. So let's say we want to say circle. We already selected circle. Okay, let's do four. So 4.2 should work, 4.2 millimeters. There you go. Um, and then we want another circle over here as well, 4.2. Okay, next I want to set where the hole is going to be. So we're going to hit D for dimension again. 
set this guy here. Let's say we want 10 millimeters in. D for dimension. And then four millimeters down. That looks pretty good. D for dimension. We will say 10. And D for dimension. And we will set, there you go. Okay, so there we go. And you'll see here when you do set a dimension using that function uh, or referencing another dimension, and it says FX here because that tells it that it's driven by an equation, not just by a raw input. So I will click finish sketch. And then we want to create the actual hole. So the way we'll do that is the same way that we created the bevel. We'll hit E for extrude. We will select the two holes. In this case, we will say two object. We will select the back face and you can see that it cuts through. Click OK. Now, one last thing that we want to do to the model, because the screw has a bevel to it itself, we want to countersink the screw into the model. So we want to create a chamfer for this screw. So let's go modify chamfer, select the two holes and I'm not sure. Let's go with two. Nope, two is too big. <laughs> you can see that uh, the chamfer now runs into the fillet there. So 1.5, still too big, 1.3. Okay, that's good. So the chamfer here does not hit the fillet on the top. Uh, you could, it could hit it, it's not a big deal, but just from an aesthetics perspective, it's probably better to leave it that way. So there you go. Now that should give us plenty of room for the bevel of the screw here to fit into that chamfer. So, okay. So the model from my perspective is done. That's really all we need to do to it. Uh, the next step is to export the STL into a slicing program. Now the new version of Fusion does have a slicer built into it now. I've never used it so I'm just going to stick with my tried and true mechanism that I've been using for years which is Simplify 3D. So to export the model we click on tools, we select make otherwise known as 3D print. We will select the model here. I will turn off send to 3D print utility because we don't want to send it directly to anything. We just want to save the STL. So what I'll do is I'll click OK, I'll save the STL, and then I'll switch us over to Simplify 3D. All right, well, here we are in Simplify 3D. I have already loaded the model onto the print bed and I uh, have an issue on my Prusa printer where there's a little artifact on the bed. So that's why the model is not directly in the center of the bed. I have some, the PEI bed has been torn after years of use. So I just slide the model a little bit to the side. Okay, let me walk you through what we've done here. So I've already created a process and simplify. A process is how you define how you wanna slice the specific model. You can have multiple processes for multiple different models or multiple different things you wanna to do to a model. In this case, we only need one process. Let me double click it here. So in Simplify 3D, I have plenty of different profiles. You can see here, there's lots of them. The one that I my go-to profile is this Prusa PLA 10 profile that I use and then I modify from there. What that is, is it is specifically for the Prusa printer. It is for regular temperature PLA and it's got a 10% infill. That's how I name things. So. You can see the screen here. The basic information on this screen really is setting the nozzle diameter, which is 0.4. For the extrusion multiplier, I sent it to 1.0. I'm using the Matter Hackers filament. It's a sample that I actually received through their uh, monthly subscription service or every other month subscription service. I find 1.0 works perfectly fine for the Matter Hackers filament. Some filament like PETG, you need to over extrude a little bit because it does shrink. And then I have actually run across filament that is thicker than it should be. Instead of the 1.75 millimeter diameter, it's a little bit thicker. So you want to under extrude a little bit so that it's uh, you get a proper extrusion width out of that nozzle. Uh, the rest of the settings, the retraction settings, coast and wipe and all this, this has been set up for years now for my Prusa. I found these are the values that work the best for me. Your mileage may vary, especially with the new Prusa printers and the Prusa slicer. There's different settings you might want to tweak there. So layer height here, I am printing at a 0.2 millimeter layer height. I have three layers on the top three layers on the bottom, and then four perimeters. Now, normally I would not do four perimeters, but because of the nozzle width and the thickness of the wall, 
uh, four should give us a nice even multiple of the thickness of the nozzle diameter versus the wall uh, thickness without any infill, which would cause the print head to go back and forth a lot instead of just around in a circle. So theoretically, they should help it print faster. Next is temperature. I have a 55 degree bed temperature. That's what I print all my PLA on. And then in terms of the extrusion width, I set it at 210. This filament goes anywhere from 195 all the way up to 220. I found uh, 210 prints pretty well. I have not had any jams or any issues with that as of yet. So that's good. Cooling, one thing to note here. So again, I start with the fan on zero for the base layer. So we'll get maximum adhesion. And then for the second layer, I go to 100% on the fan. If you are printing at higher temperatures, you might want to ramp that fan up slowly from zero to whatever your final uh, fan speed is, especially when I print on high temperature PLA or the PETG. I do ramp it up over the series of about three or four different layer increments there. So. So in terms of infill, I am using rectilinear infill on both the internal and external patterns. I do have it set at a positive 45 and a negative 45 degree angle, and I will show you what that means in just a minute. Last thing I want to point out here is the speed. I am printing at 60 millimeters per second. The Prusa does pretty well at that speed. A more normal or a more traditional speed would be 40 millimeters per second. I can print as fast as 80 with not too many artifacts on the print itself, but 60 is a good kind of medium print speed. It's fast, but it's a medium in between the slowest and the fastest that I can print. So it's gonna turn out, I think, pretty okay with at 60. So we'll click okay. Now, the reason I love Simplify 3D is how quickly it slices models. I've been 3D printing for a long time, and the some of the slicers that were on the market back in the day could take 15, 20 minutes to print a relatively simple model like this one or they could take hours to slice a very complicated model. I have sat through that pain many times. And when I stumbled across Simplify 3D, the slicing times were amazing. I gotta be honest with you, as far as I know, it's still one of the fastest, if not the fastest slicer on the market today. It's getting a little long in the tooth, quite honestly, but it's still the fastest that I know of. So we will click prepare to print. And there you go. It sliced the model. What was that? Maybe a quarter of a second to slice this model? That's why I love Simplify 3D. Now I did uh, have a skirt and brim turned on, so I do get this nice line around the outside. I use the skirt and brim to set the first layer height. On the Prusa, you can dynamically adjust the Z height, and uh, rather than do it on the print itself, I found using a, a skirt that is two layer widths thick gives me enough time to adjust the height and you get a pretty good, in fact, a very good first layer. All right, so I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom here of the print and show you what I meant about the infill. So this is the base layer and you can see the four perimeters and then the fill here. Here is the first 45 degree and then the second layer, the next layer up, creates an alternating pattern. So even though it is only a 10% infill, you actually end up with, with what is closer to a 20% infill because of that cross hatch pattern on every other layer. I have just found that it prints faster because you're you're printing less material on the infill, but you're getting a denser infill by having that, that crossing pattern. All right, I'll just spin this around to the back. You can see the holes. Now, normally, if you had a hole like this, you would want to put some sort of support material in here. This hole is not nearly big enough to need support material. Uh, so we should be fine without any issues here. And you can see our lovely chamfers. Oops, you can see our lovely chamfers here. They look very good. That is the model. I will click uh, the save the tool path here to the disc and then we will pull the the sliced model into Octopi, which is what is my go-to application for sending a print to my 3D printer. Print this guy, I wanna load it. All right, it says it's gonna print about two hours, which is fine. I'm gonna let this continue to stabilize. I'm gonna go over to the printer and uh, clean off the goop that's coming out and we're gonna run with it. Go. <laughs> All right, so in the Prusa, you can adjust the Z height 
kind of uh, on demand, and so that's what I've done. Uh, I was turning it the wrong way, so half of the first bottom layer here is not going to be awesome. Hopefully it won't cause a problem, but we'll see. All right, well, the print is done, and I pulled it off the printer, and it looks fantastic. So here we have it. This is the model. It looks wonderful. This red, this Matter Hacker's red, is just fantastic. It's got a nice pearl sheen to it. It just looks wonderful. Uh, the print turned out pretty well. It's got some issues. The Because the filament I'm using is actually a sample, I don't have it on a spool. It did get bound up twice, so there's a little bit of some lines uh, near the bottom and near the top where it got kind of wound around and wasn't uh, really coming out very uh, very well. So I, it's got some artifacts there, but that's okay. All right, let's have a quick look at the base. You know, I was having some issues getting the Z height aligned properly, and I will show you the output of what, what happened there. So let, all right, there's a good picture of the base. You can see right here where I was adjusting the Z height and it was just entirely too far off the bed. And then it came down here when I finally got it flattened to where it should have been. And uh, it looks just wonderful on the rest of the base here. It does have a couple lines on it from, uh, just my print bed is marred up from years of use. But other than that, it looks very good. The chamfers turned out very well. Again, let me see if I can focus in on that for you. The chamfers turned out very well. You can see the area where it's having some little print issues, that little line right here. There's a line in the bottom, on the back as well. It's got that little, whatever that is there. So, all right, other than that, it turned out very well. So we need to test, here's my screw. Make sure that the screw fits in the hole. And it does, it fits very well. So you can see here, if I can, uh, it fits nice and flush to that hole. So that's good. I guess we should have done this to start off with. Does the remote fit? <laughs> I'm pretty confident that it'll fit. The measurements are pretty easy. So there you go. So it fits in, it's nice, it's easy to pick out. Yeah. So what we will do is we will take this up to the garage, we will stick it on the wall. We will put our remote in, we will rest it there. So it should work out pretty well. All right, well that was the video. I hoped you enjoyed it. So we took the concept of a remote holder for this remote and we turned it into reality by following the three-step process of design, model, and print. This is a process that I use frequently for lots of things around the house. It is a very practical approach. Now I do spend a lot of time 3D modeling a lot of my projects, whether they turn out to be 3D prints or whether it's something that I'm making in the garage. It just helps me think through the process and come up with kind of a methodical plan to how I'm going to approach some of my products. All right, well that's it. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you don't like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up anyway, but please leave your comments down below and tell me why you didn't like the video and we can make future videos better. If you're not already following me on Instagram, please do so. That's where I post pictures of my projects, many of which become these videos. Okay, well, I thank you so much for watching the video and getting this far. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing, ringing that bell, very important these days. And don't forget, to be inspired. That's not too bad. Better than the first one. Construction lines give us a point of reference or a point of dimensions, uh, but it's <clears throat> constructions line. <clears throat> construction lines. Wow. That's harder to say than I one, one would think. Because the screw has a, what's it called? Um, now that should give us plenty of room to have the, the I don't know what this is called. You know, whatever, bevel. <clears throat> now I'm gonna use regular old dry roll. <clears throat> Holy shit balls. Construction lines give us a point of reference for the sketch, but are not part of the actual, uh, they are part of the model. I don't know what to say. Um, construction lines give us a point of reference for future design artifacts or something like that. That's ridiculous. All right, we'll cut that part out. <laughs>